In this video, we begin our exploration of entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. We start with the Carnot cycle, which is a cycle for what we would might call the ideal engine. It's a cycle that is completely reversible. Every step in this four-step process is a reversible step. And if you recall, when we first talked about reversibility, that the work that we get out of a reversible process is the maximum we can expect to achieve. In the first step of this process, starting with point A, going to point B, we have an isothermal expansion in which heat flows in from a heat source, in the case of an engine, for example, that might be a gasoline, a combustion engine of some kind, flows into the system. The gases expand isothermally from point A to point B. Step two begins at point B and then goes to point C, and that's an adiabatic expansion in which there is no heat flow. The heat source is removed from thermal contact with the engine at that point, so there's no heat flow into the system. It's just a simple adiabatic expansion. Now, of course, in these expansion processes, um, the work is negative because the system is doing work on the surroundings, and this is the part of the process where we get work out of the system. Of course, at the end of the second step, after the adiabatic expansion, the temperature has dropped. So now the temperature is lower than the TH temperature um, that we had initially in the isothermal expansion. The third step and then involves an isothermal compression uh, where heat with, is withdrawn from the system and dumped into a cold sink of some type um, and that's at temperature which we will call T sub C. The final step which takes us back from point D back to the initial step of the system so that we have a complete cyclic process is an adiabatic compression um, and Q is equal to zero. Now note in steps three and four in the compression steps, the system is having work done to it by the surroundings, so W in those steps, of course, will be greater than zero. So in the first two steps, we have expansion, where the system is doing work on the surroundings, um, and then the final two steps involving compression has the surroundings doing work on the system. It's a cyclic process to get us back to step one. That, of course, is critical if we're going to have an engine because we need to keep doing this over and over and over again if we're going to have continuous motion resulting from the process. Now, of course, we're interested in the efficiency associated with this cyclic process. Um, and remember, again, since each step is reversible, this is the maximum amount of work that we can get out of the system. So very simply, we'll define efficiency as negative work um, again, remembering that when the system does work, that in fact is a negative value itself. So efficiency is defined as negative W divided by the amount of energy that we're putting into the system, which of course is the heat dumped into the system in that first step. It's interesting to note that negative W, uh, which represents the work that we get out of our system, is equivalent to the area enclosed by the cycle. So if we were to calculate the area enclosed by the lines in the cycle, the pressure volume um, curves in the cycle, that area is in fact equal to negative W. Now let's examine the efficiency a little bit more closely. Of course we have a cyclic process, so since um, it starts with step point A and goes back to point A, delta U for the entire cycle is equal to zero. And that, of course, means that um, W is equal to negative Q, um, negative Q total. And that's, of course, due to the fact that, as we know, delta U is equal to W plus Q total. So therefore, uh, W is equal to uh, negative Q sub H plus QC because, remember again, we get heat going into the system um, in step one and going out of the system in step two, but, uh, excuse me, step three, but, but steps 
uh, 2 and 4 are adiabatic, so there's no heat transfer in those two steps. So therefore, the total amount of heat transferred is equal to QH plus QC um, in this particular system. And then, of course, remembering that um, the definition of efficiency is negative W over Q sub H, uh, we can make the simple substitution here uh, where we bring QH plus QC into that um, and we find that we have a, a new equation for efficiency based on heat transfer. Um, now, this is lesson one. Why is this lesson one? Well, remember that in this process, Q sub H involves heat into the system, um, and when heat is transferred into the system, uh, we know that's an endothermic process, so Q sub H is greater than zero. On the other hand, step three, where heat is lost, and transferred to our, our cold sink, um, because heat is lost, that corresponds to a situation where Q is less than zero. And since Q is less than zero, Q sub C is less than zero, um, that means that uh, QH plus Q, of Q sub C is going to be less than Q sub H. Um, and since Q of H plus Q of C is less than Q sub H, um, we're going to find, therefore, that particular quotient is less than 1. Uh, this leads to what's called the Kelvin Planck statement of the second law of thermodynamics, which basically says that uh, for a cyclic process, uh, the efficiency must always be less than 1. The amount of work that we get out of the system is always going to be less than the amount of energy that we put into it. All right, so let's look at the individual steps in this process to analyze the total amount of work done um, in the Carnot cycle. Um, and at this point, you're probably asking yourself, well, what the heck does this have to do with entropy? Uh, well, patience, young Padawan. It's coming. All right, so step one being the reversible isothermal expansion. We've already talked about this, and the equations for that are simple. Um, we're not going to re-derive them here. Uh, we just simply know that the work for step one is very simply just equal to um, negative nRT sub H, where T is the temperature of the um, hot source, um, times the natural log of the volume at the end of step 1, uh, V sub B divided by V sub A. That's simple enough. Again, we've derived those equations already, so there's no need to go through that. Second step being reversible uh, adiabatic expansion. Again, we've also talked about that, assuming an ideal gas, as we did for step 1, um, then we know that for the adiabatic process, work is equal to delta U, and delta U is equal to uh, the number of moles times the molar heat capacity times the temperature differential. Um, step three, also being an isothermal process, has a very similar equa equation to step one. The only difference is the volumes here, um, corresponding to the final and the initial volumes for um, the this, this step three process. And finally, for step four, the reversible adiabatic expansion, we have an equation that's that's um, just again dependent on the heat capacity and the temperature differential. Um, it's interesting to note, of course, if you compare step two and step four, um, that they really have the same magnitude, they have the opposite sign because step two is Tc minus Th and step four is Th minus Tc. So these two steps actually cancel each other out. So the total work in our system is just the sum of the work that we get from step one and step three. And here we have the equation for the total work in our system. Again, step one and step three, all right, uh, where we're looking at the, at the volumes associated with the initial and final points for those two steps in our cyclic process. All right, so th that's all fine and dandy. We've got this nice little equation that gives us the work. But we can simplify this if we can find a relationship between the volumes um, VB over VA as opposed to VD over VC. And the, and the key to that is, is looking at um, the adiabatic steps 2 and step 4. So we go back to our equations for an adiabatic process, um, a reversible adiabatic process involving an ideal gas, 
and again we're not going to go back to the beginning to derive these just to go back and take a look at what we talked about earlier in the semester um, we have first of all this equation that relates relates temperature of course to temperature ratio to the volume ratio for step two um, and again um, getting rid of the natural logs with the exponents we end up with this second mathematical step here um, and then if we just um, with the exponents divide the exponents on both sides by CV that gets us to this relationship here for the temperature of our heat source divided by our temperature of our cold sink related to the volumes VB and VC. Um, with step four we have a similar kind of mathematical explanation. We start with the basic equation for the adiabatic uh, process. We get rid of the natural log so we have these exponents. We divide through um, the exponents by CV and we end up with this um, here. Also for the ratio of THTC. Um, now of course the important thing to note here is that there is a relationship uh, we have now have two ratios and two relationships for TH over TC. At the end of step two, we have this equation for TH over TC. At the end of step four, we have this relationship for TH over TC. So let me uh, uh, reiterate all that, having erased all these markings to make it clear. Um, at the end of the step two adiabatic calculation, we have this nice relationship here uh, involving TH over TC and we have the same thing here at the end of our adiabatic calculation for step 4 um, and so we have also this TH over TC so now we can actually see that because of that We'll note that these terms here involving the volumes are equal. So we end up with this equality here. Of course, the exponents will cancel out, and so that means we're going to see that VC over VB is equal to VD over VA um, and just rearranging that um, if, we, if we just glance up to our top equation here we see that VB over VA is in the first natural log and VD over VC is in the second natural log we can just simply rearrange our equation here algebraically and we end up with this expression here that relates VC over VD to VB over VA. Uh, we can then, at this point, make the substitution into our top equation now that we have this relationship here, uh, making that substitution. So when we make our substitution here, uh, for the first term, for the second term, which was, um, again, looking at the second term, VD over VC, um, we'll make that, we'll understand that that's equal to VA over VB, as we have down here. So we've made the substitution, so the first term has VA over, VB over VA, the second term is VA over VB. Remembering properties of logarithms, we can invert this. Um, and put a negative sign in front of the log itself. And so combining these two terms then gives us a simpler relationship here for work, which is equal to negative NR times the temperature difference between our source and our sink, multiplied then by the natural log of that volume ra ratio for the first step. Going back to our calculation for efficiency then, um, where efficiency is defined as negative W total divided by Q sub H. Um, and going back to the first step which we talked about earlier, where for that first isothermal step, where Q sub H is 
um, added to the system, um, we have Q sub H being equal to this relationship. Um, and then going back to what we derived on the previous slide, we can see that making the substitution for Q sub H, then making the substitution for W from the previous slide, which is what we derived here, the natural log terms, the NR terms cancel out and we end up with another equation for efficiency that's related to the temperature difference. What's important to note here is that the greater the difference in temperature between the source and the sink, the higher our efficiency. Um, so if we want a very efficient engine, we're going to want as much of a temperature differential as possible between the source of our heat and the sink um, that we use to get the system back to the initial point. So again, you're asking, okay, fine, we're talking about engines here. What does this have to do with entropy? Well, it was the work on the Cardo cycle um, that actually led to the concept of entropy. Um, and the Cardo cycle was developed uh, by Carnot as a way of actually uh, monitoring or determining or, or um, exploring the properties of steam engines. Uh, when he did all this and ran through these particular computations, um, we find that if we look at the comparison of efficiencies here, um, we now have these two expressions which we had derived for efficiency. Um, TH minus TC over TH is equal to QH plus QC over QH. Um, and doing a little bit of algebraic manipulation, um, we can see that we're going to get this. Continuing with that algebraic manipulation, of course, the ones cancel out. And we're left with this expression here, which relates the temperature uh, ratio to the heat ratio. Okay. Um, again, just rearranging the equation algebraically, we end up with um, this expression here, uh, where we have the heat transferred in step one divided by the temperature in step one plus the heat transferred in step three divided by the temperature in step three. Um, the sum of those two is equal to zero, which means that th that would be like a, for a cyclic process. For our cyclic process, this ratio of Q over T um, is equal to zero, and, and expressing that mathematically um, with the integration, that means that we have this cyclic integral, that's what the little circle there in the middle of the integral sign represents, of dQ over T. Um, is equal to zero. So for this cyclic process, dQ over T is equal to zero. All right. Now we've added this little um, subscript REV um, because we know the Q is path independent, as path dependent. Um, unlike, for example, internal energy or enthalpy, Q and W remember are not functions of state and therefore depend on path. So we have to be very specific because all of our discussion here was done for reversible process. So this derivation only works for reversible process, and therefore we have to be specific in our integration here that this dq for a reversible process only. This would not be true for an irreversible process. But the indication of this is since we've got a cyclic process here, and since over that cycle this particular mathematical function does not change, meaning that over the cycle at dq over t, integrated over the cycle is equal to zero, that means this dq of t is a new function of state because it does not change, because it's equal to zero. And we are going to define that as entropy. So this is how we arrive at our definition of entropy, that it's equal to dq reversible over t is equal to ds. It's related to, again, the reversible heat transfer in a process. And again, let me reiterate that, that it's, rever it's for the reversible process only that we can do this. It is essential that when we're doing these calculations, we must come up with a path that is reversible before we can calculate entropy changes. So how do we calculate entropy changes for various processes? That will be the subject of our next video.